Section 16 of Sketches of the Fair Sex in All Parts of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sketches of the Fair Sex in All Parts of the World by Anonymous. Section 16 Origin of Nunneries. Soon after the introduction of Christianity, St. Mark is said to have founded a society called Therapeutes, who dwelt by the Lake Morris in Egypt, and devoted themselves to solitude and religious offices. About the year 305 of the Christian computation, St. Anthony, being persecuted by Diocletian, retired into the desert near the Lake Morris. Numbers of people soon followed his example, joined themselves to the Therapeutes, St. Anthony being placed at their head, and improving upon their rules, first formed them into regular monasteries, and enjoined them to live in mortification and chastity. About the same time, or soon after, St. Synclitica, resolved not to be behind St. Anthony in her zeal for chastity, is generally believed to have collected together a number of enthusiastic females, and to have founded the first nunnery for their reception. Some imagine the scheme of celibacy was concerted between St. Anthony and St. Synclitica, as St. Anthony, on his first retiring into solitude, is said to have put his sister into a nunnery, which must have been that of St. Synclitica. But however this be, from their institution, monks and nuns increased so fast that in the city of Orixa, about seventeen years after the death of St. Anthony, there were twenty thousand virgins devoted to celibacy. Such at this time was the rage of celibacy, a rage which, however unnatural, will cease to excite our wonder when we consider that it was accounted by both sexes the sure and only infallible road to heaven and eternal happiness, and as such it behoved the church vigorously to maintain and countenance it, which she did by beginning about this time to deny the liberty of marriage to her sons. In the first council of Nice, held soon after the introduction of Christianity, the celibacy of the clergy was strenuously argued for, and some think that even in an earlier period it had been the subject of debate. However this be, it was not agreed to in the Council of Nice, though at the end of the fourth century it is said that Syracuse, bishop of Rome, enacted the first degree against the marriage of monks, a degree which was not universally received, for several centuries after we find that it was not uncommon for clergymen to have wives. Even the popes were allowed this liberty as it is said in some of the old statutes of the church that it was lawful for the pope to marry a virgin for the sake of having children so exceedingly difficult is it to combat against nature that little regard seems to have been paid to this degree of syracus for we are informed that several centuries after it was no uncommon thing for the clergy to have wives and perhaps even a plurality of them as we find it among the ordinances of pope sylvester that every priest should be the husband of one wife only and Pius the Second affirmed that though many strong reasons might be adduced in support of the celibacy of the clergy, there were still stronger reasons against it. Description of the Great Convent at Ayuda in Rio Janeiro At the end of the chapel is a large quadrangle entered by a massive gateway, surrounded by three stories of grated windows. Here female negro peddlers come with their goods, and expose them in the courtyard below. The nuns, from their grated windows above, see what they like, and letting down a cord, the article is fastened to it, it is then drawn up and examined, and if approved of, the price is let down. Some that I saw in the act of buying and selling in this way were very merry, joking and laughing with the blacks below, and did not seem at all indisposed to do the same with my companion. In three of the lower windows, on a level with the courtyard, are revolving cupboards, like half-barrels, and at the back of each is a plate of tin perforated like the top of a nutmeg grater. The nuns of this convent are celebrated for making sweet confectionery which people purchase. There is a bell which the purchaser applies to, and a nun peeps through the perforated tin. She then lays the dish on a shelf of the revolving cupboard and turns it inside out. The dish is taken, the price laid in its place, and it is turned in. While we stood there, the invisible lady warder asked for a pinch of snuff. The box was laid down in the same way, and turned in and out. Ceremony of the Initiation of a Nun The disposition to take the veil, even among young girls, is not uncommon in Brazil. The opposition of friends can prevent it until they are twenty-five years old, but after that time they are considered competent to decide for themselves. 
a writer describes the initiation of a young lady whose wealthy parents were extremely reluctant to have her take the vow. She held a lighted torch in her hand in imitation of the prudent virgins, and when the priest chanted, Your spouse approaches, come forth and meet him, she approached the altar singing, I follow with my whole heart, and accompanied by two nuns already professed, she knelt before the bishop. She seemed very lovely, with an unusually sweet, gentle, and pensive countenance. She did not look particularly or deeply affected, but when she sung her responses there was something exceedingly mournful in the soft, tremulous, and timid tones of her voice. The bishop now exhorted her to make a public profession of her vows before the congregation, and said, "'Will you persevere in your purpose of holy chastity?' She blushed deeply, and with a downcast look, lowly but firmly answered, "'I will.' He again said more distinctly, Do you promise to preserve it? And she replied more emphatically, I do promise. The bishop then said, Thanks be to God, and she bent forward and reverently kissed his hand, while he asked her, Will you be blessed and consecrated? She replied, Oh, I wish it. The habiliments, in which she was hereafter to be clothed, were sanctified by the aspersion of holy water. Then followed several prayers to God, that, as he had blessed the garments of Aaron with ointment which flowed from his head to his beard, so he would now bless the garments of his servant with the copious dew of his benediction. When the garment was thus blessed, the girl retired with it, and having laid aside the dress in which she had appeared, she returned arrayed in her new attire except her veil. A gold ring was next provided, and consecrated with a prayer, that she who wore it might be fortified with celestial virtue, to preserve a pure faith and incorrupt fidelity to her spouse Jesus Christ. He last took the veil, and her female attendants, having uncovered her head, he threw it over her so that it fell on her shoulders and bosom, and said, Receive this sacred veil, under the shadow of which you may learn to despise the world, and submit yourself truly and with all humility of heart to your spouse to which she sung a response, in a very sweet, soft, and touching voice, He has placed this veil before my face, that I should see no lover but himself. The bishop now kindly took her hand, and held it while the following hymn was chanted by the choir with great harmony. Beloved spouse, come, the winter is past, the turtle sings, and the blooming vines are redolent of summer. A crown, a necklace, and other female ornaments were now taken by the bishop and separately blessed and the girl bending forward he placed them on her head and neck, praying that she might be thought worthy to be enrolled into the society of the hundred and forty-four thousand virgins who preserved their chastity and did not mix with the society of impure women. Last of all, he placed the ring on the middle finger of her right hand and solemnly said, So I marry you to Jesus, who will henceforth be your protector. Receive this ring, the pledge of your faith, that you may be called the spouse of God. She fell on her knees and sung, I am married to him whom angels serve, whose beauty the sun and moon admire. Then, rising, and showing with exultation her right hand, she said emphatically, as if to impress it on the attention of the congregation, My Lord has wedded me with this ring, and decorated me with a crown as his spouse. I here renounce and despise all earthly ornaments for his sake, whom alone I see, whom alone I love, in whom alone I trust, and to whom alone I give all my affections. My heart hath uttered a good word. I speak of the deed I have done for my king. The bishop then pronounced a general benediction and retired up to the altar, while the nun professed was borne off between her friends with lighted tapers and garlands waving. End of section 16